Hi everyone. I am Cindy Pryor. I teach government in the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department here at St. Phillips, and I'm grateful to be able to speak about women in their fight against place. Well, we're focusing on women and their struggle to get the right to vote, but really we can see that struggle in a broader context of anyone who is struggling against being told that they have a defined role that they should play in the world. You know, that they have a place predetermined by a society or a higher being or someone, and that they shouldn't deviate from that. Maybe you've heard the phrase, she should know her place. So that's the struggle. I want to start then with a little consideration of why American women might have challenged their place and become activists. One reason was because of the status of married women. Coverture, which is a legal doctrine that rendered a wife in her possessions as basically the property of her husband, was a big motivator for many women. Coverture was uh, in place in many states in the United States on through the 1880s. Slavery was certainly another motivator. Many early suffragists became activists because of their opposition to slavery. Other issues were social problems such as alcoholism and child labor. Regarding child labor, I have to include this poem by Sarah Norcliffe Cleghorn. The poem, written in 1914, six years before the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, reminds me of some of the things that were significant during this time period and that really underlie the social activism of the time. And that's the sense that something was not right in the world and somebody had to do something about it. The golf links. The golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day, the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. I like this poem because it so vividly and succinctly illustrates the kind of oppression and exploitation that spurred many women to become activists. And it's sad to note that exploitation of labor, labor of slaves, labor of children, labor of women was a central building block of our nation. So while there's not one single motivation that pushed women to struggle for the right to vote, many surely saw a world in which the powerful exploited the less powerful, and they wanted to change that. It's true that many of the suffragist women were well-to-do, either through inheritance or their husband's wealth, since few women were offered avenues for building their own wealth. Yet, they identified with the exploited. Poor women, children, minorities, especially Black Americans who had endured slavery. And they felt that one way to improve society would be through political power. They were fired up about building a better world. My personal introduction to activism began the summer after my freshman year in college in 1977. I had read about what was going to be a big event happening in Houston, the National Women's Conference. Now, I want you to think a minute about this relatively recent time in history. When I was a wee lass in the 1960s and early 1970s, all kinds of changes were happening for women. We saw big changes, such as the right to privacy regarding contraception in the Supreme Court decision of Griswold versus Connecticut, and that was in 1965. We saw an increase in access to birth control. The publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. The creation of the National Organization of Women, Title IX of the Education Act, and also trend changes, such as the mass production of pantyhose, I hate those things, <laughs> and the increased popularity of miniskirts. To give you a little idea of the pace of change during my early lifetime, Let's go to my hometown in Northeast Texas. My county is circled there in red. When my sister, two years older than I am, began high school, 
girls were forbidden from wearing pants to school unless those pants were part of a pantsuit. Jeans for girls were not allowed. Dress length was strictly monitored. Oh, and when my sister entered high school, it was the first year of integration. The first year blacks and whites went to the same schools in my hometown, and that was 1970. By the time I was in high school, things had changed pretty dramatically. Jeans, mini skirts, everything. So I felt sophisticated and progressive. So in November of 1977, in the midst of all these rapid changes for women, I drove down to the National Women's Conference in Houston just to see what was going on and to purchase my first woman power t-shirt, which read, a woman's place is in the house and also in the Senate. Things became more crystallized for me with that slogan. People were fighting against being forced into unchosen places and being forbidden to enter other places. But what got us there to the feminine mystique and birth control and pantyhose and the National Women's Conference? As I said earlier, there were a lot of women who became activists in the 1800s over the issue of slavery and coverture, and of course the right to vote. After slavery ended and the reconstruction of the Union advanced in the late 1800s, women throughout the United States began to focus more closely on suffrage. Some states had already given women the right to vote in local elections, and some even had given women the right to vote in state and national elections. There was not, however, universal acceptance of a woman's right to vote throughout the United States. Southern states tended to lag behind Northern and Western states in allowing women to vote and Texas fits that Southern state mold. By the way, I'm relying on the handbook of Texas, which is totally online for much of my information here about Texas women and suffrage. I urge you to go to the Texas State Historical Association's website to find endlessly fascinating information about all things Texas. It's amazing. It's one of those books you would want with you on a deserted island. And by the way, St. Philip's own history professor, Alan Hamilton, is the author of four articles in that handbook. He's also the recipient of the Mary John and J.P. Bryan Leadership and Education Award for 2018. He is an awesome professor. And shifting back. Now, the history of women's suffrage in Texas goes back to the early days of the state. After Texas reestablished itself as part of the union, legislators were willing to consider giving women the right to vote. In the Texas Constitutional Convention of 1868 to 1869, a proposal that supported women's voting rights was voted out of committee but it was voted down 52 to 13 by the convention delegates. And at the Constitutional Convention of 1875, two more resolutions for women's suffrage were initiated, but neither was voted out of committee. From the 1880s until 1893, with the creation of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, Texas women such as Jerry Bland Bouchamp Mariana Thompson Folsom and Eliza E. Peterson advanced the cause piecemeal across the state, often in conjunction with the temperance movement. And you remember the temperance movement was an attempt to get prohibition in place. After a brief presence in the 1890s of the Texas Equal Rights Association and the Texas contingent of National American Woman Suffrage Association, and after other attempts for state legislation offering women the right to vote, the woman suffrage movement hit a kind of lull. Organizations formed and faded. Strong leadership and organization weren't consistent. One bright spot was right here in San Antonio when civic leader Mary Eleanor Brackenridge, the sister of George W. Brackenridge after whom the high school and the park are named, she established the uh, Equal Franchise Society, 
She conducted meetings, distributed much literature supporting women's suffrage and got people activated. There is a picture of Mary Eleanor Brackenridge, again, from the Handbook of Texas. Novita Idar published impassioned articles supporting women's rights in her Laredo family's Spanish language newspaper called La Cronica. She encouraged women to proudly raise their chins and face the fight. I don't want to do too much name dropping here, but women from various backgrounds contributed to these early efforts. Eliza Peterson mentioned earlier was African-American. Ovidi Dar had Mexican ancestors. Brackenridge was from that foreign place known as Indiana. So women from all backgrounds, mostly middle and upper class though, were involved in the suffragist movement in Texas. During the early 20th century, the Texas Women's Suffrage Association under Brackenridge's and later Minnie Fisher Cunningham's leadership grew in influence and was able to gain a foothold of support in the Texas legislature. The tide seemed to be coming in. Remember too that this is the time of what's known as the progressive era in the United States. One of the most stirring and nuanced brief accounts that I've read of that era in Texas is the entry in the Handbook of Texas written by historian Walter L. Binger. As Binger states, progressivism was an ideal, an aspiration to construct a better world through science, engineering, education, wide, wisely constructed laws, and more modern social norms and habits. Binger continues to explain Texas legislative support for women voting. Part of the motivation of members of the legislature seems to have been to secure the vote of progressive women for William P. Hobby in his gubernatorial campaign against the recently impeached governor, Jim Ferguson. So all this is happening around 1916, 17, and 18. Of course, <laughs> there were some women who were actually anti-suffragists. That's an interesting picture, isn't it? Okay, the Texas Association Opposed to Woman Suffrage officially organized in Texas in 1916 and went about trying to prevent the passage of legislation to give women the right to vote. They argued that women didn't really want the right to vote, that giving women the right to vote would destroy homes, and that woman suffrage would result in domination by the Black race. I'm not sure their logic. Their first major battle to prevent the Texas legislature from giving women the right to vote in primaries, which required only legislative approval, not Texas voters approval, ended in disappointment for the anti-suffragists. In 1918, women in Texas could finally vote in political primary elections. Suffragists had successfully capitalized on the skills they had developed during their support the war effort during World War I and the widening opportunities of a more urban and modernized economy in developing Texas. In 1919, however, anti-suffragists defeated a proposed Texas constitutional amendment that would have provided full voting rights to women. Their massive campaign which included sending out over 100,000 pieces of literature, successfully kept the state's voters from approving woman suffrage. But of course, their success, as the Handbook of Texas states, was short-lived. Right after Texas's constitutional amendment vote for woman suffrage was defeated, the federal constitutional amendment for woman suffrage, the 19th Amendment, came before a special session of the Texas legislature for approval. When the Texas legislature, with support from Texas Governor William Hobby, voted to approve the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, Texas became the ninth state in the nation and the first state in the South to approve the amendment. Texas women voted in a general election for the first time in 1920. Well, we should say white women, because really 
Black women did not secure equal voting rights until later, after the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in Smith v. Allwright in 1944, after the outlawing line of the poll tax in 1962, and the passage of the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. So Texas prevented Black women and Blacks in general from voting in primaries because Texas had what they were called white primaries. Only white voters could participate. So it was, it was a, probably 1965 and thereabouts when the federal government put pressure on states to be sure that everyone had equal voting rights. As stated in a Rutgers University publication about women's suffrage, oh, let me include this right here, I'm sorry, barriers to the to women included, again, these white primaries, poll taxes, and then just general discrimination. Contrary to po popular opinion, the 19th Amendment did not give women the right to vote. It guaranteed women the right to vote. When we think about 1920 as an anniversary, we must remember the long, hard struggle and the incremental successes that kept women going along the way. I'll give a government teacher's plug to federalism here. Federalism, with all its flaws, enabled women to have voting rights in various states and territories throughout most of the nation's history. Those pockets of almost equal voting rights helped seed the national movement and fueled women's persistence in struggling against place, in struggling against being relegated to diminished citizenry with diminished rights. Today, 101 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we still talk about equal rights. As I mentioned earlier, barriers to black women voters in Texas per persisted until the 1960s. And some say that barriers still exist through state voting laws such as the photo ID law passed in 2013 and challenged in the courts until it was modified and implemented in 2018. In general too, a woman's place continues to be defined. According to the Brookings Institution analysis of 2018 American Communicated, I'm sorry, American Community Survey data, before COVID-19, nearly half of all working women, 46% or 28 million, worked in jobs paying low wages with median earnings of only $10.93 per hour. The share of workers earning low wages is higher among black women at 54% and Hispanic and Latina women at 64% than among white women at 40%. Reflecting the structural racism that has limited options in education, housing, and employment for people of color. While many women choose lower paying jobs as second family incomes and are not economically injured by lower pay, many do not have options. And now we're finding that the pandemic is affecting women more negatively than it does men. Again, according to Brookings, COVID-19 has increased the pressure on working mothers. In a survey from May and June, one out of four women who became unemployed during the pandemic reported the job loss was due to a lack of childcare, twice the rate of men surveyed. A quick internet search of the phrase women in the pandemic brings up a multitude of studies and articles exploring the excessive pressures on women. As a national public radio article states, in September, an eye-popping 865,000 women left the US workforce, four times more than men. The coronavirus pandemic is wreaking havoc on households and women are bearing the brunt of it. Not only have they lost the most jobs from the beginning of the pandemic, but they are exhausted from the demands of childcare and housework, and many are now seeing no path ahead but to quit working. And again, that's from an NPR article. So a woman's place. I imagine my grandmother, there she is, Lily Watson, born in the late 1800s, 
who never had the right to vote in federal elections. She died in her 20s when my father was two. I think of my mother who came from modest means and never graduated from high school, but who ascended to upper middle class stability by marrying my dad, a doctor, and who gave me my first political memory by taking me to a local campaign headquarters when I was six. And I remember it vividly for some reason. I think about my daughter who when she was four and reading a Sesame Street book that pictured a woman doctor shocked me by saying, isn't that silly mama? A woman doctor. Her expectations were already conditioned despite my best efforts. Now she, a contemporary college educated and politically active woman, a business owner, wife, mother, she, like the women discussed in the NPR article, struggles to balance the responsibilities of work and children and home. Women have come a long way in the history of the US. At least since the 1960s, women consistently register and turn out to vote in greater numbers than do men. We've moved from legalized discrimination, remember coverture, to a good measure of legal equality. But culturally, the fight against place continues. I appreciate your time today, and I hope I've piqued your interest in Texas women's suffrage. The last slides give you some wonderful sources to consult. I urge you to spend some time with this fascinating, fascinating topic. So here we go with the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, and they have a wonderful exhibit. Here is Humanities Texas with also an exhibit on the women's suffrage movement. Here's the Bullock Museum, Sister Suffragists. Here's the National Park Service, Texas and the 19th Amendment. Here's Texas Women's University, the women's suffrage movement in Texas. This is a video uh, by a woman from Allen, Texas. It's great, it's on YouTube. So I recommend that. And certainly don't forget the Library of Congress. That is another place that you could spend a lot of time doing research in. Excellent source. I did want to just give you some image sources here. And then list of sources. And then other great stuff that's out there. There's some great articles. There was a lot of work done this past year and continuing into this year, despite the pandemic. Okay, that gets me to the end of my presentation. I appreciate you all very much, and uh, I hope you enjoy your research. Thank you. Bye-bye.